going on, everybody? How you doing? It's the Friday before Christmas Eve. I hope you're all doing great. Having a good weekend so far? Well, I guess it's Friday. Does that qualify as the weekend? Some some people do. Some people don't. It does for me. Friday starts the weekend. Very excited. Very excited for Christmas. Very excited for the show that I've got for you today. Very excited for the show that we've got coming up on Sunday, Christmas Eve. And uh, and I'm very excited in general just because uh, I just I just love this time of year. It's wonderful. I absolutely love it. <clears throat> it's uh, it's just, you know, how can you not be happy and joyous? I mean, I know everything's got, yeah, everybody's got their own shit going on. So for some people, it's not as joyous as others. But, you know, you got to find a reason to be happy. You know what I mean? You got to find a reason to be happy. The world's, the, the world, the universe is always going to find shit to throw at you. It's always going to have shit to throw at you. But, you know, you got to be able to, uh, to, to pick up your own energy and, and, and make that positive and help other people be happy because that comes back around. It's like, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you, you put out good positive energy that tries to make other people very happy and, and things like that, that comes back around. People want to do the same for you. So it, it feeds your own positive energy by putting positive energy out there. <clears throat> So anyways, I just wanted to, you know, because look, I've, I have loss during the holidays. It got rough. (laughs) It got, it got, uh, it got hard to be happy and joyous and find festive or, or find reasons to be festive during the holidays. And, and, uh, but you know, I realized like I'm not doing myself any favors by by wallowing in the in the in the 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 loss and the emotions and all that, even though it does come up and it's healthy to grieve and all that those things, it's you also just have to pick yourself up and 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 bring some positive positivity into your own life. You know, like you got to create the world you want. You know what I mean? Anyways, I just wanted to put that out there because I know this time of year is a mixed bag of happy, sad, angry, lonely. It's, It's a mixed bag. And so people look down on each other for various reasons. You know, I don't understand why you can't be happy during the holidays and and uh, well, I don't understand why you're always happy during the holidays. Well, you've never suffered, you know, shit like that and. So anyways, I just wanted to put out there that I love you all. And no matter what you're going through, I hope this time of year you can find a reason to be happy, find a reason to, to make somebody else happy. And uh, hey, that's why I do this show, because I want to I wanna, I wanna make you laugh, make you think. Uh, and, and yeah, so anyways, let's get right into it. Enough of, come on, enough of the Dr. Phil shit. Let's get into it, shall we? All right. So here's what I got for you. Right off the bat, we're going to start with uh, the Peruvian. Is it Peruvian? Yes, Peruvian mummy. Hoax? Well, that's what it appears to be. Here's what I got. I got this video. Now, I'm going to translate for you. It's got subtitles and all that, but it's hard to listen to. I mean, for me, maybe you like the cultural, um, what would you call it? Chaos that is... Um, Telemundo, uh, but it is to me. It's hard to it's hard to watch. It's hard to listen to one because I don't understand, and two, it's just so chaotic. It's hard to pay attention. Anyways, here here's what I'll do. This is a this is Anthony Choi, who is a Peruvian ufologist. So mind you, he is a UFO researcher, right? So along with the other people that want these things to be true, this guy, I'm sure believes in some cases that I might be skeptical of or others might be skeptical of. So he is a believer of UFOs. He's a believer of aliens. Let's establish that. He's not a he's not a, a naysayer per se, but he is a UFO researcher. So it, I think his claims are as valid as the UFO researchers that have brought the mummies forward, regardless. Anthony Choi 
was a guest on a show called America Hoy, which is really funny that uh, it's America Hoy talking about Peruvian mummies in Spanish. I don't know what it has to do with America, but either way, it's a it's a TV show, um, and they are talking about the Peruvian mummy. So let let me play a little bit for you, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then we'll get into it. Joyce, lo que mostraron ayer es patrimonio arqueológico peruano, sí o no? A ver que nos responda. Para usted, si es, para usted que. And by the way, I'm not going to read the subtitles because that's dumb. And uh, and if you speak Spanish, me uh, translating in English is going, I would think, diminish the experience. So anyways, I'm going to let you listen to this for a little bit. Also, you can read the subtitles if you're watching. But then I'm going to break down the whole thing. So anyways. Es <laughs> Voy a olvidarme de cómo ayer hablaste mal del Perú y de las instituciones peruanas en un territorio mexicano. Me voy a olvidar de eso. Joyce, dime, ¿de <laughs> dónde the, sacaron the sound of las glass. Porque un descubrimiento arqueológico necesita un contexto, necesito Cristian. ¿De dónde lo sacaron? Lo, lo, lo que, que él nos contaba, lo que él que nos contaba Anthony, que seguramente también te va a responder, pero mientras hacemos la conexión en cualquier momento... All I want to say is, I want American anchors, American news anchors, to talk with this level of enthusiasm. Because a lot of times they get up there and they're just like, so today in the news, <laughs> this, these people are just, well, the way it sounds to me is like, oh, I'm down, I'm down. and then there's breaking glass and there's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised there's not some lady screaming in the background. It's, it's fantastic. I love shit like that. I suppose an American media they do have like gunshots when they're talking about war and explosions and you know people crying to really hammer home all the propaganda but you know with this anyways i'll continue on just a little bit because you know i want to get into it and i don't speak spanish lo que él nos decía era que el Ministerio de Cultura a esto no le dio importancia, ni siquiera dudó un segundo en hacerle ningún tipo de análisis. Entonces, prácticamente salieron en calidad de bultos porque el Ministerio de Cultura no se preocupó en hacer las revisiones necesarias a esos cuerpos y secados. Yo lo que hice una pregunta a Joyce. Joyce, lo que mostraron ayer es patrimonio arqueológico peruano, sí o no? A ver que nos responda. Para usted. Si es, All right, let's get into it. Es patrimonio okay, arqueológico. so basically, here's what's going on, okay? And look, I hope you got something out of that. I I just wanted to, I don't know why, but I thought it was important to show the video because like I do with other stories, I, I showcase a news story or whatever, so I play the video and I thought, well, just because it's in another language doesn't mean I shouldn't give it the same time, right? And just because I don't speak Spanish doesn't mean you don't speak Spanish. So why would I assume and then read the subtitles for you when you're probably smarter than I am? Also bilingual because you're probably educated. I'm a dumb fuck. So anyways, here's what they're going on about. Okay, so this, again, Anthony Choi, renowned Peruvian ufologist is how they describe him, how he's self-described. He denounces these uh, Peruvian mummies. And he says that, uh, he, he describes them as a sorry and shameful fraud that has gained global attention. He refutes the assertion that the mummies are non-human and a thousand years old. He, he challenges all of it. Um, in fact, there's, uh, Mexico's, uh, Universidad Autonoma, Autonoma, which is UNAM, I, I think it's a university, also questioned the validity of carbon-14 tests in establishing the mummy's origin, stating they only determine antiquity, not whether it's human or non-human, okay? And then this Anthony Choi, he's got over 20 years of experience, apparently, uh, he called on the Ministry of Culture, is what it's called, to intervene in this case, um, and that he says that he's concerned that these mummies are a misrepresentation of figures as extraterrestrial beings. So he believes it's an absolute fraud, and as I do, he believes it discredits the entire movement, 
do you want to call it a movement? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I feel like it's a disclosure movement because we're in the process. I compare it similar to like cannabis, except we don't have a bunch of people out there. I mean, you do have dumb people making dumb claims about cannabis, but it seems to not be as fraught with fuckery as it, as, a, as the UFO stuff. But the way I describe it is, is like, the movement in cannabis was people trying to establish validated research and evidence to support the claims that cannabis heals, that it's medicine, right? And that's into a whole nother thing. It got established as more recreational than medicinal now. And so that whole argument's kind of become diluted. But either way, the UFO field is very similar in the way that we need validated research and evidence in order to establish the validity of the phenomenon. So very similar in that way. So when you have people coming forward with fake, false, misrepresented information, disinformation, it, it just discredits everything that surrounds it because you can easily say well yeah okay you have this one case right here that seems compelling and unexplained unexplainable but then you have these thousands of other cases that can clearly be shown that is are either incredibly inconclusive, as in the the photos that come out of it, the videos that come out of it, are nothing. There's no context. So so people say, oh, look, it's a UFO because I saw it with my eyes, but the picture doesn't represent what I saw. Well, then that's not evidence. But they want to claim it's evidence because their words are saying, well, here's what I saw, and this is what's in the picture, even though you can't tell from the picture. Well, then it it's it's a it cancels each other out it's hearsay period there's no evidence to back it up i was incredibly um uh skeptical of this when it first came out because it looked fake one it just looked it looked like a a 12 year old paper mache like hey here's the here the teacher right is like okay kids so Assuming it's a, I don't know, a, a crow, I guess. Okay, kids. So uh, I want you to uh, create real, realistic looking mummies out of paper mache. And then the kids go and they make paper mache. And the best one that comes out of a group of 12 year olds, the best one that comes out is this. It's the best version of a 12-year-old paper mache project. <clears throat> it's still bad. It's still it's unbelievably bad. And I was I was shocked that people were I I wasn't shocked because these days with Jeremy Corbell running around squawking at every little thing that pops out, uh it 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 it, it does it's not surprising that people are just grabbing onto every little thing. But I was incredibly, incredibly skeptical of this. And so apparently so is this UFO researcher. And what, what's interesting is you won't hear Jeremy Corbell talking about this. You won't hear George Knapp talking about this. You won't hear Ross Coulthard talking about this. But yet when the mummies came out, they were all talking about it. They were all talking about the Peruvian mummies. Whereas now they're not talking about, oh, well, it might be a hoax. Because that's not what they do. As soon as the evidence proves that it's not, or I shouldn't say prove, it disputes heavily whether it's true or not, like the evidence and stuff, then 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 they back off immediately. But let's let's keep in mind that this comes from where where this is the same group of people that back in 2017 there was a video put out by Gaia. Dot com, which I love those people. I love the idea of having a whole bunch of people talking about their ideas, talking about theories, speculating about what's out there. But instead, what you have is you have a bunch of people that are faking being experts 
because they have a PhD behind their name or whatever it is, that they make these crazy claims like a lot of these things are absolutely true and factual when it can't be proven. It's based on faith and belief. Either way, in 2017, Gaia.com came out with this and, and, uh, and said that they had this mummy named Maria, had an elongated skull, three digits on each hand and foot. It looked like a, a, uh, a previously debunked Nazca mummy in 2016. So they got on the alien mummy hype and it went international because all these UFO enthusiasts picked it up, okay? And uh, there was this uh, deal where they, they were trying to uh, exploit Peru's historical traditions and endemic corruption, I, I, apparently, uh, according to this, there's a there's an article about this about how it was all debunked. But there was a whole bunch of professionals that descended upon this and were able to quickly debunk the claims that it was an alien mummy. They showed that it was fabricated using human and reptile remains, as in they were uh, uh, modified. They were modified. So I apologize, my phone is so. In 2018, there was a bill proposed um, to Peruvian Congress. Kitties. They're, they're wild this morning. They're wild. <laughs> um, to allocate resources for further analysis in the mummies, on the mummies, right? And they ended up determining that it was absolutely fake. And not only that, the person who claimed to have discovered the mummies had been arrested in 2007 for having forged banknotes and gold and was linked to gang involvement of stealing and trading archaeological artifacts from the Nazca civilization. So we're talking about like the, the, the enemy of Indiana Jones. All right, we're talking about the douchebag German guy in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark when, you know, Indiana Jones is running out of the tunnel and he, he barely evades the big ball and he jumps out of the tunnel covered in cobwebs. Who's standing there? Evil dick German. Okay, well, this is basically who we're dealing with. And people like Jeremy Corbell... And everybody else who jumped on this mummy thing are propping these douchebags up. And then you've got, not only that, does it sound familiar? They're asking for funding to further study this. Sound familiar? Like everything that's going on in our current Congress? With everybody saying, we need more money. We need more money to study the phenomenon. It's a scam. This is a scam. It's a scam. And now you have a 20-year Peruvian ufologist who knows the culture. He knows the history. He's he I mean the the Nazca lines, we're talking about the same area where there is legitimate seems to be legitimate alien phenomenon. I don't know. How else do you explain the Nazca lines and and things like that. It's 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 all all in that area. It's crazy. So, but it goes back to ancient times. And while I would love to believe that there's thousand year old alien mummies just buried somewhere where we can cinnamon, please. I'm right in the middle of a show. Cinnamon, come on now. Look at this. Look at this. Look at look at this. Look look what I got to deal with. Come on, get out of here. I love them so much, but God damn it. <laughs> They're just such attention whores. They're such attention whores anyways. They want to be in here with me when I do a show. But then at the same time, they want to be out. They want to be in. They want to be on me. They want to be near me. It's But yet they want to be in. The, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Anyways. I am going to pat myself on the back real quick. And I'm going to say I called this. From the very beginning, the moment I saw the Peruvian mummies, I was like, bullshit, 
bullshit. They don't even look real, let alone anything that points to them being real. And there was all this talk, oh, but they've got doctors that are claiming that they, they, they've got these x-rays. They've got the, dude, no way, man. No way. So anyways, all the links will be in the show notes. I highly encourage all of you to look into it yourselves. Excuse me. Um, and make up your own mind. But I'm going to call it right now and say this is absolute fake horse shit. Like I said from the beginning. Like I said from the beginning. Absolute horse shit. Um, but watch the whole video. Subtitles if you don't speak Spanish. And, uh, and make up your own mind. Also look into the history of the situation of the person, the people that were involved in this. They're shysty bastards. They're shysty bastards. How can you trust anything that comes from them? You know, a broke clock is right twice a day, week, uh, every Thursday. I don't remember. But all I'm saying is it's broken. Can't be trusted. All right. (laughs) Anyways, let me know what you think because, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this that are absolutely on board. They believe that this is real. They believe that these Peruvian mummies are real. So what do you think about this Peruvian ufologist, 20-year researcher, who believes it is a hoax? What do you say about him? What do you, I mean, do we have evidence that says, yes, it's alien? Do we have evidence that says, yes, they're real? I don't believe we do. And you've got a university in uh, Peru, you've got a, a Peruvian ufologist both saying it's a hoax. So what are you going to believe? What do you believe? I'm very curious what you think about this. So please, please let me know. I, I, I really, if I'm wrong about this, first of all, that would be amazing that to find out that it truly is alien mummies. But uh, I don't think I am. I'm fairly confident that I'm not wrong on this because I've got this guy saying I'm not. And I've got a university in Peru saying I'm not wrong either. And so anyways, so they're not saying I, they're not being like this Ben guy's got it right. No, (laughs) I just mean that I agree with their standpoint. And I've been saying this since it came out since day one. So anyways, please tell me I'm wrong. Let's talk about it. All right, now on to the next story. All right, so let's get into something that, of course, has been uh, going on for a while and uh, and is still going on, and I don't think we'll ever know, but we're talking about, well, let's just get into it. I'll let the story start for itself, and we'll talk about it. Due tonight, a federal judge has ordered court documents naming associates of accused child sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein to be unsealed. Epstein died by suicide in prison back in 2019 while waiting to go on trial for running an international child sex ring. The court documents are expected to reveal the names of more than 150 people. The judge has given those on the list 14 days to appeal the decision. The names are expected to be released sometime in January. All right, so... Here's what I'm going to say. Uh, this has been going on for a long time, right? Do, do you think that any of this is going to change? I'm, I'm legitimately asking, do you think any, any of this is actually going to happen? A federal judge coming forward saying that they need to release the names of 150 plus people involved in the sex trafficking that claims of Jeffrey Epstein. So, you know, they, they say they, what they say, supposedly killed himself. No, no, man, no way, no way. Um, but let's get into it. So yeah, they claim that he died of, of suicide in jail and, uh, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell's convicted in 2021, even though no names were given. In 2017, some parts were unsealed, but there's, there's, 
debates, which I don't even understand why it's a, ba- a debate, but there's debates on whether it even should be released or not, which it absolutely should be. And um, they unsealed these documents in 2019 and nothing came out of it. Nothing came out of it. It remained in uh, in in court forever under under further review. Further review. Here we are, 2023 going into 2024, and uh, we still got nothing. There was also another judge, Judge Preska, that ruled for unsealing more documents in 2020. And so now you have another one. You got another one. You got another judge that's that's need, wanting this to be released. The people do. Now, what I believe is they're just trying to give people enough to keep them quiet. I mean, I don't think people understand, like, maybe some people do, maybe some people don't, but do they really understand the ramifications of what it means to have a government, have intelligence communities such as the FBI, the CIA, complicit and potentially facilitating sex trafficking of children? You know, that's a scary proposition because, one, I mean, it's one thing to, you know, know that your government is taxing the shit out of you and, you know, uh, uh, you know, making Supreme Court rulings such as, you know, police don't have a constitutional right to protect, protect citizens. But to know that it's worse than that, that it's worse than that, it's, it's, it's diabolical that politicians are facilitating and participating in child sex trafficking is scary scary so truly along with all these other things you know people make it out like like the ufo topic is the biggest cover-up in american history it can't be proven So far, it has not been proven that that's what the cover-up is and that's what's going on. Again, I think there's a very real possibility that the the cover-up involves the technology transfer from the Nazis and what we did with it and how far advanced we really are as a nation that's kept behind closed doors to only profit those who invest in the technology. You and me don't have the potential to invest in that technology. So we're not going to be, we're not going to be involved in the chain of, of information, the chain of communication with all this stuff. They're not going to tell us, but this, this doesn't involve This is like evil, evil shit. And yeah, you could argue that it's evil keeping advanced technology away from humanity so we could better our lives. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty bad. But I don't know about evil. Selfish, yeah. Greedy, yeah. Yeah. But this, this is straight up evil. And, and I'm, that's what I, I wonder if people really realize, like, what that means if that truly comes out. Are these, first of all, I don't think that any names are going to really be released. So what they say is that the latest order is that Jane and John Doe's are given 14 days to appeal before public release of these documents. Some of the victims are going to remain unnamed because of the sensitive nature of the crimes. Epstein's associates involved in the sex trafficking crimes are supposed to have their documents unsealed. This includes the Ghislaine Maxwell's 2016 deposition and emails and depositions with others. 
Um, it's supposed to have the associates involved in Epstein's crimes. Some of the victims have already been identified. Some of them haven't. But, and then there's the whole island thing. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the deal with, uh, and this this section of the episode might get me in trouble. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anymore. Um, but uh, so that's why I'm just going to fuck it, you know. But um, there was a guy, Luke Radowski, that went out to the island with a buddy of his, and they, not like in a, with Epstein, but after everything was shut down, and they snuck on the island, and what they showed was the main temple where supposedly everything went down as far as, you know, the actual, uh, you know, having people out there and what they were doing, the rituals and all this weird shit. And we really don't know still what, what truly happened out there. We just know there was, you know, miners brought out to the island supposedly to and that facilitated this for high-ranking officials. And so... But what they found is they found that the temple was a solid concrete structure that was painted to look like a temple with no entrances, no doorways, no windows, just a a blank concrete slab made to look like a temple. So my theory is, that it's actually a staging island, a decoy, like a decoy duck to throw everybody off. The whole thing, in my theory is, the whole thing of the Epstein, Ghislaine, and all that, they're fall guys that were financiers that, yeah, were roped up in the sex trafficking because everybody in that organization, whatever it is, was doing that but that they weren't the ones making the moves. And that island was a decoy island. I don't know, but that's what, that's what it seems like. That's it. That's what it seems like when you look at, when you look at like what, like the weirdness of the island having a, a blank con. I mean, when you, when you watch the video, I'll try and find it and put it in the show notes, but, um, uh, I'm going to put it, I'm going to make a note to myself right now. Um, so that way I'll make sure and put it in the, in the show notes. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's what my whole thing is, is I wonder exactly just how much of that is, is true and real. I mean, they were, they, they knocked him off. He certainly didn't kill himself, and Ghislaine is locked up in a in a in a very cushy prison. That yeah, she she pleaded guilty, but there were no names released, nothing, and it was so fast. It was so fast. It was unreal. The trial. So yeah, so I don't know what to think about that. I just think that it's it like everything else. It's not what it appears to be. So again, I'm curious to know what you all think about this because to me, it's starting to to look as though Epstein and Ghislaine were low-level fall guys for what appears to be a much, much larger uh, organization that is still is still in action. It's still in operation. And that's why I don't think these names will be released because I think these names are going to, you know, people talk about in the UFO and I bring, I, the reason I bring this up is the parallel of like the, what appears to be the, the, the weight of the situation. If it comes, the truth comes out because in the UFO field, there's the talk about the consequences of disclosure, as in what it will do to society. There's a lot of people that claim, oh, society will unravel the moment that humans realize there's aliens. 
Well, the majority of um, of people in the world already believe in aliens. So what is what it what is that? What's it going to do to confirm it? You think they're all of a sudden they're they're going to go crazy because they believed it their whole lives, but now that they know they're going to what? I mean, yeah, you're going to have, of course, everybody going, we fucking knew it, you lying pricks the whole time. We knew it. But people have already lost faith in government. People have already lost faith in the establishment. So I don't think that's going to change much. It might hammer the last nail in the coffin, I guess, to the to the fucking government, which it should. I hope it does. But... Otherwise, most people already believe in aliens. A lot of people already believe in UFOs. So what's it going to do? I think what what's going to unravel for society is going to be the people trying to keep a secret. It'll unravel their plans for whatever it is of why they've been keeping it secret to begin with. I think that's, it'll unravel that. But something like this, something like this, will truly unravel, truly unravel. At least the U.S., as far as if you find out that your entire government, we're talking about 150 plus names. There's about 400 congressmen, people, whatever the fuck. So you find out that half of them, over half of them, are complicit in sex trafficking? Well, what is that going to do? What's that going to do? That's going to start an unraveling. That's going to start an unraveling because that's something that no one wants to believe. No one wants to believe that our government, I don't want to believe it. It All signs point to yes, but I don't want to believe it. I want to believe in aliens. I want to believe in UFOs. I don't want to believe that our government is sick, satanic, worshiping assholes that are killing, murdering, and, and raping children and selling them and trafficking them all over the world. I do not want to believe that. I do not want that to be true. So I feel like that will be a bigger unraveling than UFOs. But yet people will make it out as though the UFO phenomenon, when when uh, the, the people of, of Earth know the truth, that it will upend all society, that it will just, all religion will die. All politics will die. Oh, please, please, I please... Eight pound, six ounce, baby Jesus. Please. I want that to be true. Really badly. <laughs> but uh hold on, folks. We're gonna take a break real quick. All right, we're back. I apologize. Uh my mama was calling me. <laughs> you know? Uh uh What do you think Corey wants? Corey's my uh my wonderful significant other. My better half, if you will. And uh, so anyways, you know, this time of year, you know, everybody's checking in with everybody. What do you want? What do you want? What's good? What should we, what should we get? So-and-so. So anyways, I hope you're all doing the same. But that that's a, I'm, I'm actually glad that happened because, I, you know, I, I want to get off the Epstein thing. I mean, look, I, it's almost Christmas. I don't like bringing bad news. It's not like we don't know this exists, but I don't want to harp on it. But all I'm saying is, like, these are the types of things that I think are are more important or, or up there with on the list of things that are important that we should be looking into while we're looking into UFOs. Let's not lose sight of the things that we need to fix. You know, let's, let's not give money to UAP studies until we have allocated money to the people that need it in our own in our country and and put it to use to rid our country of corruption let's do that let's fund that let's fund an anti-corruption bill 
to get these motherfuckers out of the government so we can actually study UAPs the way we need to. Because right now, they block everything. There's so much censorship that you can't get the truth no matter how hard you want. You really want the truth. It's so hard to get. It's it's ridiculous. We need to get rid of that. Let's fund that. Let's fund a quit lying to us bill. How about that? And then we'll get a lot more answers from everything. We'll get a lot more answers when it comes to UFOs. We'll get answers when it comes to corruption in the government. We'll get answers when it comes to to Epstein and Ghislaine and, and all this, all these other people and all these other things that the JFK assassination, we still don't know. Let's fund that. Let's fund a truth bill, an anti-lying bill, which is basically going to make everybody that's in government have to uh, throw themselves on the sword, which I'm down for, man. I'll grab a mop. I'll clean up after. No problem. All right, let's get into the next story, shall we? Shall we? Researchers, let's do it. I know, so much to worry about these days. You can now add killer books to the list. Really, (laughs) actually. Sounds crazy, but researchers at a Wilmington Museum, they are now sounding an alarm around the world about... Book coverings from part of the 19th century, they're covered in a very dangerous chemical, and they Mm -hmm. can make you very sick. NBC 10 Delaware Bureau reporter Tim. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Let me get these subtitles out of here. Did you? I didn't know that. That's crazy. That was crazy to me. Anyway, so let's continue. For long. Now, with the researchers who discovered this danger. These two women from the Winterthur Museum in Delaware trying to save the world one very old green book at a time. The color is that really bright, vivid green, not like a dark forest green, but like this really brilliant green. While repairing an old book a couple years ago, Melissa and Rosie discovered that these books published in England and the U.S. from the 1840s to 1860s that had green cloth coverings, well, it turns out the green color came from dye made of arsenic. Arsenic? Holy shit. Did you know that? That blew my mind. Arsenic. Seriously, poisonous stuff right there on the book cover. Oh, yeah. I'd been working on it. I'd been poking it with tools, you know, looking at it really closely under the microscope. So that that was a little scary. It's the pigment that makes them bright green that contains the arsenic. Arsenic is one of the components. And these old books, Winterter had a bunch of them out in the open. Researchers, students, visitors could just go in there, pull one off a shelf, check it out, take it home, because we didn't know. Their green books from that era are now kept in sealed bags, and they're also giving online talks to spread the word about the possible dangers of handling the arsenic-dyed books. This project has massive reach. There could be thousands of books like these all over the globe. Iceland, Australia, Taiwan. So we are getting the word out. The Winterthur team also sends out these bookmarks with a QR code that links to more information about the books and the dye, the possible very serious chronic medical conditions arsenic can cause, and also what you should do if you come across one of these green books in question. Don't just throw them in a trash can. Bag them up. If you have to handle them for whatever reason, you'd want to wear gloves, nitrile gloves, so the kind of things you see doctors and nurses wearing. Books are generally good things, but these and other old green ones <laughs> books, like them. Books are generally good things. Books are generally, generally good things. Interesting way to phrase that, huh? Books are generally good things. Uh, usually they are pretty. I mean, when is a book bad? A book isn't bad. Books aren't bad. It's the messaging within. I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's any of it's bad. It's just, I don't know. To me, that's such an interesting way to phrase that. Generally, books are good. Yeah, they need to be taken out of circulation. In Wilmington, Tim Furlong, NBC10 News. So let me ask you this, okay? Because, whoops, here's what I thought of. I thought when I I heard that, first of all, it, it blew my mind that there are potentially books out there made from arsenic, but I I thought, okay, so you're telling me that it's not okay for us to handle or have out in the open, and yet these books have been around for hundreds of years, and and they're, they're, they're poison? So 
why is is there is there a a record of people just dropping dead from handling these books or I, that's what I didn't understand. So part of me was like, is this propaganda? Is this propaganda that they're saying that we, that they're basically making people afraid to look into history from the original texts? Is that what they're trying to do? Is this a concerted effort to try and make people afraid of history in a in a weird by like a, a, a I don't know like a roundabout flank maneuver you know it seems it seems odd to me it seems odd to me that there's not a record of people dropping dead from just handling these books and yet you have these people that are saying well that's exactly what'll happen well, then how come there's not a record of people just dropping dead after handling these books? How come there's not a book about deadly books? You know what I mean? It just seems to me there's the reason I say this is it seems to me that there is an effort to hide human origins, to hide historical relics, facts, stories, accounts, you know what I mean? To, to, I guess, to, as, as, uh, Michael Cremo says, uh, in, in, a, in a pursuit of knowledge filtration is making books dangerous, seem dangerous. I, I, you know, it, it just really struck me. I, I thought, I feel like this is propaganda to make us afraid to look at and touch and handle because which means that you're not going to read it. And and then if it doesn't get online, well, now you're really not going to be able to read it. So does that mean that, that they're going to start telling us that all of these books that these ancient texts that talk about human origins, talk about like the book of Enoch, are they going to say next that things like the book of Enoch and whatnot are, are now poison books, dangerous books, not because of the, Oh no, it's not because of the information. It, excuse me. It's because of the, the, the paint because they, if they tell you the information is dangerous, now you can call them out for saying, for spreading propaganda right, for telling you, trying to hide information, censor information, if they tell you it's dangerous. But if they tell you the book itself, not because of the words within, which that's what they might really be telling you, but that the cover will hurt you, the paint will hurt you. So don't be digging around in historical texts because it'll hurt you. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. History is dangerous, right? That's what I'm getting out of it, but I don't know. I don't know. Tell me what you think. But I, I, not that I'm saying that this doesn't happen, but again, you're telling me that an ancient people, or let's, you know, from the 19th century, it's not ancient, but old, people in the 19th century were handling, working with, painting with arsenic, and yet the book remained in circulation? Why is there not this trail of, of dead people surrounding this book? You know what I mean? Wouldn't you think there'd be some kind of urban legend, if nothing else, that says this book has killed people? And people that don't know about arsenic aren't going to know that that's what's killing them. So wouldn't it become like a, a cursed book at least? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just don't, I, I feel like this is propaganda. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think. But to me, that's what it, that's what it says to me. So what it says to me, but you know me, I, I always land on propaganda. Always, always. I default on propaganda, but Hey, you know, I'm right. Sometimes, you know, broken clock is right. Twice a, every Thursday past Saturday. All right, so let's look at this. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. I don't have a video on this. 
tried to find one, don't have one. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter captured images of something odd carved into the Martian landscape. Launched in 2006, the MRO is a NASA spacecraft designed to explore Mars and assist in missions by providing high-quality images. On August 18th, the MRO captured images of peculiar ridge lines on Mars, sparking interest in the scientific community. These ridge lines are not evidence of ancient Martian roadways. So, right away they're saying, it's definitely not Martian roadways but are natural formations, natural formations. Does that not sound familiar? Remember the last episode we did, I talked about the study that came out from mainstream archaeologists saying that the Gunung Padang is natural formation, which no way, dude, no way. If you look at it again, uh, let me see if I can find a picture of it real quick so I can put it in here. I can't believe I spelled it right. <laughs> I, I am blown away. <laughs> uh, blown away. Let me see if I can open it up here. And give you an image. There we go. Mm, there we go. This is the one. Ganung Padang. That's what they're saying in a new study. They're saying that that is naturally formed. That. Tell me how that's possible. How it can be naturally formed into the rectangular formations like they are not only the blocks themselves, but then formed into, as you can see from the image, and, you know, look it up for yourselves, Ganung Padang, if you're only listening to it. There are, there are, they are stacked in a rectangular formation on top of the blocks themselves being elongated rectangles. What, where else does this form? I've never seen this. Uh, in, in, you know, I watch a lot of documentaries on ancient stuff. I've never seen that. I've never seen a rock that was naturally formed that way. Because naturally formed rocks are round and smooth, generally speaking. Because it's the wind and the sand or water that has rushed over them to round off the edges. How is it, how is it naturally formed into being a square? That's what I don't get with the flat ends. No way, man. No way. So back to this, the language is that it was naturally formed and it's definitely not ancient Martian roadways. Well, it says that these ridge lines are not evidence of the ancient Martian, but they result from the slow movement of ice on Mars' surface, shifting soil and stony deposits over thousands of years. While ice deposits are commonly found around the polar caps, these ridge patterns indicate ice presence in various other regions. The MRO plays a crucial role in studying Mars by collecting data from its orbit, aiding in the search for water and providing insights into Martian processes. The gradual movement of ice and its impact on Martian landscape over thousands of years can be studied using MRO imagery. This information helps reveal the history of Martian terrain and contributes to understanding water distribution and mineral formations. I also feel like the fact that they keep using the word Martian instead of Mars landscape, Mars processes, you know what I mean? Mars roadways. I feel like they're also they're also signaling while denouncing the fact that it could be Martians. It could be aliens. I don't know. It's it's cool though. But the other thing I say is like do we really know this came from Mars? You know, I mean we're talking about NASA here. We're talking about never a straight answer. So they're just now just giving us images of Mars that show compelling 
images that that show potential roadways or I mean it's it's just uh you know I uh, why why are they showing us this and I don't I don't you know I I've, I've said this before all the images that come from the rover um that's actually on the surface it looks like it's Arizona and then you look back in in not that long ago and NASA admitted that they were adding color to the Martian landscape to make it look red. It's not even red. The sky is blue. Our sky is blue. Arizona has red landscape. How are they not just taking this stuff in Arizona? And then at the speed of which the rover, what, 0.6 miles per hour, 0.3 miles per hour, some bullshit like that, how the fuck are you going to cover an entire planet going 0.3 miles per hour? It'll take you a thousand years, you dumb fucks. Why are you making it so slow? Because, in my opinion, that's how they can explain why they're not getting all these grand, vast images. They all look the same. Because it's in Arizona. Remember the the Mars training facility is in Arizona? Just so happens to be coincidence? I think not. I think not. So again, all the links will be in the show notes. Look at the story for yourself. Very interesting if it is true um, that it's ice. Might not be. Might be aliens. Might be alien roadways. Maybe. Let's get into some more fuckery, shall we? (laughs) Some more. Let's do some more. Here's an interesting one. Happening in Antarctica. The balloons for these missions aren't your standard weather balloon. When inflated, they're as big as a football stadium and can carry up to 8,000 pounds of payload all the way up to the stratosphere. It's about 31 miles above Earth's surface. First of all, whoever this this show's sound guy is needs to be fired immediately. The fact that they don't have a tighter mic on this chick is unbelievable to me. I mean, she sounds like it sounds like the mic is three yards away from her, and she's shouting in an auditorium. How dare you, sir? How dare you? You're a news station. Get your shit together. The acting chief of NASA's balloon program says that his current location, Antarctica, is an ideal launch point because the continent has near constant sunlight right now. With the balloons that we're using, they go through, in a, on any other normal launch, they'll go through day-night cycles, and that day-night cycle will cause it to go up a little or down, descend a little bit. And whenever we do that, we end up losing helium. Because as you go up, the helium vents out, and then that causes, you know, we need more weight and ballast, and it reduces our mission time. This year's star mission, known as Gusto, will aim to float for close to 75 days. The current record flight time is just over 55 days. We're looking uh, to get it to float around the pole. So uh, we're waiting for the weather pattern set up so we get a nice circumpolar wind and it'll just do basically circles around the pole for for however long we can get it to go and this is an idea of how the winds behave around the south pole you can see those easterly winds that continuous flow comes from earth's rotation and temperature differences at different latitudes during the gusto flight a set of highly sensitive equipment will detect carbon oxygen and nitrogen near the center of the milky way galaxy nasa hopes these measurements will further the understanding of what exists between the stars and how it developed other balloon flights will measure sound waves in the stratosphere as well as cosmic ray electrons and positrons Okay, so first of all, let's say this. When the fuck are we going to get over balloons? We're, we are in a day and age of nuclear technology in drones. What the fuck are you using a goddamn weather balloon for? What are we doing with a fucking weather balloon? I don't understand that. I don't understand that. On top of that, do we, 
you need a balloon in Antarctica to study the stars? Let's talk about what we already have studying the stars. And this is just a handful, folks. This is just a handful. First of all, the Hubble telescope launched in 1990 has been providing images, stunning images, by the way, and data about the universe, again, since 1990. 33 years, people, 33 years. But yet you need a a, a weather balloon that's going to be up for 75 days in Antarctica to study what's between the stars? What? What am I missing? Then you have this Chandra X-ray Observatory launched in 99 that gives uh, uh, X-rays from high energy regions of the universe. A fucking balloon's not going to do that. Then you have the Spitzer Space Telescope launched in 2003. It observes the universe in infrared then let's let's go on what's on Earth. You've got the Keck Observatory, one of the best in Hawaii. The Twin Deck 1, the Keck 2, both looking at the stars. Ve- the Very Large Telescope, which, believe it or not, is the actual name, the VLT, Very Large Telescope. Chile, you are incredibly original. Four, it's got four optical telescopes. You've got the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or the ALMA, also located in Chile. And it observes the universe in millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. In other words, there are a lot of ground-based and space-based telescopes with all kinds of different purposes and specialties. And there's new ones being developed all the time, all the time. But yet, but we need a weather balloon in Antarctica at at 120,000 feet above Earth at 70 days, 75 days or what it is, to 3D map the Milky Way. What? What? I this is this has got to be propaganda. If it's not propaganda, it's the biggest waste of money ever. Cuz what the fuck are you going to get? What the fuck are you going to get that Hubble, Chandra, Spitzer, Keck, the very large telescope and the Atacama array are not already getting? Are you kidding me? And it, it's, it's, it's laughable. It's laughable. I, I, it, it, it blows my mind that they throw this out like as though that it, it, obviously people that aren't paying attention are going to be like, oh, look at that. They're trying to study the stars, but uh, no, this is an absolute scam and gimmick. How much you want to bet that in two months, three months, There's going to be another wave of balloons that go across the U.S. or or wherever. How much you want to bet that they're putting it out? Oh, weather balloons going up in Antarctica. So that way they can just say, oh, well, of course we have weather balloons up. Oh, we just put one up in Antarctica. It's a weather balloon. Mm. Dude, I'm calling absolute bullshit. For no other reason other than the fact that we don't fucking need another one. We don't need another one. We don't need a fucking weather balloon in Antarctica to study the stars when we have a telescope in the fucking stars. Unbelievably stupid. I just, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. And guess who's paying for it? We are. We are. Same as the UFO stuff, it's 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 just a scam to get us to fund this bullshit. That what are they got? Look at these idiots in this. Look at this. Look at this shot of this. These two idiots running 
like <laughs> we're launching a balloon. ED run faster, Greg. Oh my god, so fucking stupid. How stupid do they think we are? Pretty fucking stupid because there's people out there going, wow, how neat. Ugh. That's so dumb. We're gonna launch a weather balloon from Antarctica. To go to 150,000 feet above the surface of the earth uh, for 75 days to study the stars. Because Hubble telescope, the most advanced telescope we've ever launched into the stars, that's still going and putting out the most magnificent images we've ever seen, just isn't enough. To be balls deep in the universe just isn't enough. We need a weather balloon as far away from the stars, as close to the earth as we can get. You fucking morons. How dumb, dude. How dumb. So stupid. Okay, anyway, I... Read the article for yourself. But I don't believe it for a minute. I <laughs> if, if it's happening... If they're really launching another weather balloon, it's for no, it's for these idiots to simply go over data because they're they're just they're the type to just jerk off to weather data. That's it. That it's just to allow scientists to jerk off to data. That's it. There's no other purpose. There's no other reason. How are you going to get more data than the Hubble fucking telescope is giving you or any of those other places that I mentioned? How are you getting more data out of a fucking balloon? It's, it's, no, no. All right, on to the next one. (laughs) Can you see I'm fired up on that? Can you see I'm fired up by that? Yeah, I really am. All right, so now I've got a series of clips. I've got a series of clips about scientists that are making breakthroughs in, get this, teleportation. Not only that, they describe it as Star Trek-style teleportation without actually physically sending any information, but here's what it is. It's a little bit technical. That's why I'm playing the video instead of trying to describe it because I'm a dumb fuck and I will not do a good job. According to recent studies, scientists have found a way to make teleportation possible by using quantum entanglement. This is a phenomenon where two particles become connected and share a quantum state. By the way, I've talked about quantum entanglement a lot. You know, it's one of these things that's come out that is could potentially explain communication at long distances as in interplanetary. So these whole this whole theory, the, these ideas from these ancient cultures that they had portals and stargates, or if nothing else, they had ways of communicating with extraterrestrials back in ancient times, and there seems to be some connection to crystals and things like that, which contain particles that when charged, no matter what the distance, according to quantum entanglement, still communicate. Hence quantum entanglement. So it, that's what it feeds into the ancient stories that they were communicating with extraterrestrials through these crystals that potentially some of the pyramids could add in them. Meaning that the state of one particle is directly dependent on the state of the other particle. When one particle is changed, the other particle changes instantly, even if they are separated by vast distances. This is where the idea of teleportation comes in. If two particles are entangled and one particle is destroyed, it can be... By the way, cheers, everybody. Caffeinating. Hope you're having a good one. ...be recreated at a different location, as long as the other particle is still present. This is because the state of the recreated particle is determined by the state of the remaining particle. In other words, the destroyed particle is teleported to the location of the remaining particle. According to recent studies. All right, so interesting, yeah? All right, let's continue on. Now we got we got clip number 2. Clip number 2. When asked about the feasibility of this idea, Dr. Sarah Johnson, a physicist and expert on quantum entanglement, stated, 
Theoretically, it is possible to teleport objects from one location to another using quantum entanglement. However, it is a very complicated process and requires extremely precise measurements and conditions. So what exactly would be required to make teleportation a reality? First and foremost, the particles that are entangled need to be perfectly aligned and in a stable state. This is because any deviation from this state would cause the teleportation to fail. Additionally, the process of teleportation would require a large amount of energy, as the particle being teleported would need to be destroyed and recreated at a different location. All right, so, and, and the reason why I'm going over these clips is because it, it, it is explaining how this all works, and then I'll go into what they actually did. This means the, that the scientists and researchers, but this is explaining because uh, look, I can't explain the science. I'm a dumb fuck, as I said. So I, you know, these this this information here is important to understand if you're to understand what they're how they did what they did, which we're going to go over. That teleportation would only be possible if the energy required to teleport an object is less than the energy required to move it physically. Another challenge is that the teleportation process is not yet fully understood. Scientists are still trying to figure out the details of how it works and how to make it more efficient. As Dr. Johnson explains, There is still a lot of research that needs to be done to fully understand the process of teleportation and to make it more reliable. All right, so all of that to go into what they actually did. So the researchers demonstrated a form of teleportation of images using a quantum transport method. And the method doesn't physically send any information between the sender and the receiver, resembling Star Trek-style teleportation. The breakthrough is a crucial step, excuse me, as the study says, toward establishing a quantum network for higher dimension entangled states. Traditional methods involve physically sending information, but this technology allows information to be teleported without physical transfer. Excuse me. Oh, my goodness. Laser optics are used to eliminate the need for physical transfer of information, sending it apart, setting it apart from previous quantum information transport methods. The use of a nonlinear optical detector is the key breakthrough enabling communication without additional entangled photons. The approach incorporates up to 15 dimensions of data and is scalable to even higher dimensions. The scalability opens the door for quantum network connections with high information capacity. No physical transfer means no interception or hacking by unwanted parties. Example, securely sending information like fingerprints from bank authorization without risk of an interception. These are all what they're saying are the advantages and then the disadvantages of doing this. The critical disadvantage for doing this is the current configuration might allow a cheating sender to keep copies of the information, potentially leading to the creation of clones. As in, almost like when you send an image via email, that person could take that image make a copy before sending it on. So like if you have a client and you're sending it through a third party, well, that third party could capture that image. Similar to what we have now of third parties capturing your data on the way to where you actually want it to be. So like the data that, that you give to your bank, it goes to a third party before it goes to your wherever you're going to purchase. It goes to a whole bunch of people before it goes to who you want it to go to. You know, so very, very similar. Um, the practical use, despite the potentially cloning issue, the demonstrated configuration can already establish high dimensional secure channels for quantum communications between two parties. With further improvements, researchers believe that teleportation of entire images or even people could become a reality. The current protocol resembles teleportation, but requires a bright laser beam, which might be addressed in future developments. Does that sound like a UFO? Mm. Remember, 30 
to 50 to possibly 80 years in the future is where technology is behind closed doors. So when you read this and you see this, think about where they are 30 to 50 to 80 years ahead of this then that's probably what they're working with. So does it make you wonder? Makes me wonder if they're utilizing that. You know, I've said for a while, in order to stage a UFO, the only thing you need that they don't already have is a tractor beam. Well, they just mentioned a laser beam, a bright laser beam to teleport. So... Maybe, maybe that's basically what it is. It's slow teleportation as in a beaming up, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Interesting though, huh? I I find it interesting. All right. So now on to something else. Again, uh, more technology that I don't think we need, <laughs> but here we go. This is the Dream Chaser space plane from NASA that's gearing up to deliver cargo to the ISS. Now, remember... We talked about in the last episode how they were talking about needing a billion dollars in order to safely um, dismantle the ISS. So why are we delivering cargo? Mm, Propaganda? Maybe. Maybe. Let's see what they have to say. Could this dream chaser spacecraft herald a new dawn in commercial space travel? Showcased at this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, the Dream Chaser will start off with NASA cargo missions. But it's also being remodeled to carry humans, too. The space plane is being developed by Colorado-based Sierra Space, the spaceflight wing of defense contractor Sierra... By the way, there are so many defense contractors now that are doing things that we You know, everybody thinks uh, the main ones, Raytheon, Lockheed, uh, Skunk uh, Skunk Works is part of Lockheed, Uh, Boeing, you know, things like that. Uh, There's a whole bunch of them. But no, it's, it's, there's so many of them. There's so many of them. This one's Sierra, Sierra. Sierra Nevada Corporation. John Roth is Sierra Space's Vice President of Business Development. And behind me, you'll see our Dream Chaser space vehicle. Uh, This vehicle is currently under contract with NASA under the Commercial Resupply Services contract. And we have a contract for seven missions to the International Space Station to be able to take cargo up to the space station as well as science experiments and return those science experiments to the Earth. Why are they continuing to do science experiments if they're also talking about dismantling the ISS? Why? I think the whole dismantling the ISS thing is propaganda. Because why would you continue to take cargo up there? Why would you continue to take science experiments up? What are we talking about here? You know, when it, when are they when are they planning on on dropping out the ISS? Uh let me see if I can find where I talked about that. Let me see if I have it here. I don't remember if it was last episode or the episode before that. I can't remember. I can't remember if it was that one. I I swear that I had brought up the fact that they were going to be... I know we had talked about it. I just don't remember which episode, and uh, I'm not finding it in my show notes. So I'm not sure if I'm going to actually be able to go over it again. But the idea was that they were planning on talking about they needed a billion dollars in order to safely and effectively dismantle. There it is. Destroying the the space station will cost $1 billion. The ISS been hosting. So in the early 2030s, they're talking about decommissioning the ISS. Well, we're already in 24, basically. So you're going to keep doing, I mean, I guess that's six years, but why spend the money? 
You know, that's another thing is like everybody makes it out like uh, all these people are making it out like, oh, climate change, climate change. We, You need to stop driving your car. You need to stop cooking with gas. You need to stop uh, doing this. And you, meanwhile, they're launching more rockets than ever, than ever. They're launching so many rockets. How do you, what do you think that's doing to the atmosphere? So you're going to tell us that we can't drive our car because it puts out too many emissions, but yet the Dream Chaser, the space, the SpaceX Falcons, and whatever else he's got launching for his his satellites, and the amount of rockets that everybody else has got, China, Israel, fuck, Zimbabwe's got a goddamn space program. So, you know, meanwhile, me and you are the problem. We're the problem because we're driving our car too much. Give me a fucking break. Anyways, let's go on. The company has also signed a deal with Blue Origin to help build a private space station for commercial use called Orbital Reef. In addition to the cargo vehicle, we're currently developing a crew version of the vehicle that will be able to carry six astronauts to and from low Earth orbit to, to uh, work both on the International Space Station, but also for a commercial destination that we're developing in conjunction with Blue Origin. Uh, our space station is called Orbital. I believe Blue Origin is Amazon. Reef, and it's going to be a totally commercial space station that we own and operate and work with commercial. That is pretty sweet looking. Look at that. Let's look at that. Let me go back just a. That's pretty sweet looking space station though. You know, if you can see in the image right there, it's that's pretty cool looking, man. I mean, it's it is going to be cool, but pointless. Pointless. And work with commercial businesses for realizing their commercial businesses in space. In December 2021, NASA awarded 130 million dollars to Blue Origin to help develop its orbital reef space station in partnership with both Sierra Space and Boeing. Blue Origin hopes Orbital Reef will be a hub for commercial industries such as manufacturing, entertainment, sports, gaming, and adventure travel, in addition to being a home for crewed and cargo missions. I don't know, man. I don't know. I So much money, dude. So much money. I just, you know, like, again... I love I love the idea of space travel. I love the idea that we that people are going to be, you know, watching sports in space. I think that's really cool. You know, entertainment, uh corporate, all that stuff. But the the reality the reality is that it's always military. It's always military. So it makes me wonder, like, are, are they really actually, you know, uh, trying to, to do this? Are they trying to get people into a new space station while still, you know, uh, decommissioning the old space station? Why would you decommission an entire space station instead of just taking the cargo up there? Look, if you're going to build a whole new space station, why not just build up, repair the old one? Right? Doesn't that make sense? Or is it beyond repair? That is what I don't get. So why, why take a billion dollars to decommission the already existing space station to build probably more than a billion dollars to build a new one to me that's to me that's propaganda and i'll here's another case of propaganda by the way another case uh our wonderful vice president the dipshit kamala harris uh telling us all about putting a man on the moon Finally, regarding the importance of international collaboration on human space exploration. The Artemis program is the most ambitious space exploration effort in generations. For the first time in more than half a century, the United States will return astronauts to the lunar surface. We will establish the first lunar base camp and the first station in lunar orbit. She All is so, she, with our you know what I hate about her so much is that she talks to everybody like they're 10. 
Okay, here we go, children. It This is going to be so exciting. We're going to put someone on the moon for the first time in generations. Isn't that great, children? Isn't that great? I hate that. She talks down to everybody. I just can't stand her. Allies and partners. For example, the service module that will help carry Artemis astronauts to the moon was built by the European Space Agency. And Europe, Japan, and Canada will make significant contributions to the Lunar Space Station. Oh, good. Canada is involved. They're doing fantastic things for their people. Today, in recognition of the essential role that our allies and partners play in the Artemis program, I am proud then to announce that alongside American astronauts, we intend to land an international astronaut on the surface of the moon by the end of the decade. So an international astronaut, as in not American? What happened? What happened to the United States trying to be, I mean, if you remember the space race, it was all about the U.S. being the first to land on the moon. Why? Why are we going international? It just sounds like a bunch of uh, propaganda, doesn't it? This announcement and this meeting of our National Space Council is further demonstration of our belief in the critical importance of international partnership. So, whoop, so yeah, okay. So I, <laughs> I just, I just don't know what to think about it. I don't know what to think about it. I'm, I'm confused. Why are we, why are we, I, <laughs> one world government, man. I mean, I, you know, maybe that's, you know, going too far. I don't know, but that's what it seems like. It seems like, you know, this Artemis thing has been nothing but a big jerk off fest. I mean, there's nothing and nothing's happened with it. It didn't turn out anything like it was supposed to be. The furthest we got was Snoopy around the moon. That's the furthest we got. And now all of a sudden we're going to put a Japanese astronaut's on the moon, why? Why Japanese? Why? Why does it? Why can't it be a U.S. astronaut? I'm not. Look, I'm not racist. I don't give a fuck if the Japanese go and land on the moon. But why are we facilitating them getting on the moon? Why are we making sure that a Japanese astronaut gets on the moon? Why? Why don't we just get our own people on the moon? I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I don't understand. So I, I think that uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of things. The dream, the dream chaser, the which, by the way, that's not the only one. There's the star streaker or striker that exists from, uh, from, oh, who was it? Was it Raytheon? I, I swear it was like striker or something like that. Raytheon Striker series. There it is. Or Streaker or something like that. I could have swore it was that. I could have swore it was the... Either way. Anyways, there's a whole bunch of them, guys. There's a whole... There's a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of them. I don't know why we need another one, and I don't know why it's delivering cargo to the ISS when we're planning on decommissioning it in six years, but yet they're going to do seven missions to take up cargo. Mm. Lots of fuckery going on. Lots of fuckery. I just don't, I just don't understand. I don't understand the the prioritizing it seems to me i'm just going to put it point blank it seems to me like there are more 
money laundering schemes in the government than ever before. Like that's the goal to just set up as many money laundering schemes as possible. Ukraine, Israel, uh, uh, Artemis, NASA doing it. Um, all this stuff, every, I mean, it's like everywhere we turn the whole, the whole weather balloon bullshit, money laundering. Why? Cause it costs millions of dollars to do anything like this. The UAP studies, it's money laundering, man. Cause that's what they do. They say, oh, we need funding. And then they wash the money that we give them. And then it goes into all their pockets. Hence why they are all like, we really need to do this. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it's, I'm not convinced, man. I am not convinced. I, I am, I am more convinced than ever that all of this stuff is fuckery and that, that, uh, that it's, it's none of it's going to end in, in, uh, uh, more further. I mean, they'll make something up as though, Oh, look at the, look at the big, hold on. My camera went all fuzzy. Look at all the, look at the, look at what we did. Like with the weather balloon. Oh, look what we found out about the stars being 155,000 feet above earth. But yet Hubble telescope is literally balls deep in the universe. So dumb, dude. So dumb. But Let's wrap this motherfucker up with some festive, a festive story, shall we? Let's get in the Christmas spirit, because right now I feel a little grinchy. So let's wrap this thing up with some holiday spirit, shall we? Look at this. This is the Christmas tree cluster that was found Again, by the James Webb Telescope. Look at what the James Webb, that's one I didn't even mention. The James Webb and the Hubble Telescope have released the cosmic Christmas-themed images known as the Christmas Tree Cluster. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Here's a, in fact, here's a little, uh, here's a little story about it. Here's a little story I wrote. Not me. News Nation. Speaking of space, did you see this? NASA discovering a special spot in space that you could say is decked out for the holidays. Check this out. The discovery is called the Christmas Tree Cluster, oh. located in the Milky oh. Way, about a, uh, 2,500 light years away. I have no clue what that means, but it's a pretty cool image. Cluster. So again, you're telling me that the weather balloon in over Antarctica is going to be able to get 25 light years away like the James Webb and Hubble telescope are doing? I think not. I think not. Fuck that weather balloon. I'm sorry, I went gringy again. Apologize. Back to the holiday spirit. Stars, some even bigger than the sun, the uh, the Christmas tree cluster. Bezos paid for it. Exactly. Getting paid for that? Bezos <laughs> it's going to say Amazon. Did <laughs> Did she say Jesus paid for it? Hold on. The uh, the Christmas tree cluster. Bezos paid for it. Exactly. Oh, Bezos. Oh, Bezos paid for it. Paid for that? Bezos yeah. got that. It's going to say Amazon. <laughs> I thought she said Jesus. Oh, that would have been so funny if she said, yeah, Jesus paid for it. That's what my Baptist church said. My Baptist church told me that Jesus paid for those images to come forward uh, from the Hubble telescope. Amazing. It's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, beautiful. Be just beautiful. So cool. I love that. I love it. I love the Christmas tree cluster. So here's a here's a little um information about it. So various wavelengths and telescopes were used. The gas observed in optical category green by Wynn Observatory, W I Y N. Again, another one I didn't mention. Foreground and background stars imaged in white with two micron all sky survey, two mass. Again, another one that I didn't mention. Chandra's contribution makes the stars in the image appear to blink due to variations in brightness. Oh, I did want to show you the blinking lights because that is actually in an article. Oops. Let me see if I can get it without it doing an ad. Of course, it's going to fucking load a goddamn ad. You sons of bitches. You sons of bitches. I wanted to show you the blinking. Hold on. Let me get, let me just. 
stupid ads, dude. Just wrap it up, Pluto. God damn it. Anyways, so yeah, it's very, uh, the way it is, is um, the two young stars, one to five million years old, exhibit bright, young, young stars, exhibit brightness variations due to factors like rotation, star spots. Here we go. Look at that beautiful blinking. Look at that beautiful blinking. Magnetic fields can lead to powerful stellar flares, including X-ray flares, which are more magnetic and frequent than those from our sun. Young stars in the Christmas tree cluster may still be forming their own stellar systems. Flares from these stars can have consequences for planets in the surrounding disks, potentially causing partial evaporation. Flares can induce turbulence in the disk. I don't know what any of that means. Anyways, read the article for yourself, but isn't that beautiful? I just love it. I just love it. It's so pretty. It's so pretty. Look at it blinking. Oh, the lights of the Christmas tree. The lights of the Christmas tree are so pretty. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I believe I see militia forming. Tinfoil. It's militia. Stop, militia. The tinfoil. Militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. I want to thank you all so much. I love you from the bottom of my heart. I hope you all have a fantastic Christmas and uh, and a wonderful New Year. Uh, don't forget, we've got the New Year's big New Year show coming up on uh, on um, <laughs> New Year's New Year's Eve. Oh my God! Um, and uh, it's going to be big, man. We're going over uh, at least ninety six. 96 is the count so far. I might find some uh, between then and now. But so far, we're going to go over 96 individual cases of the best sightings and encounters from 2023. And uh, we're going to go all the way from January of 23 to October because everything after that, I just didn't find a whole lot to go on. But the, uh, the good ones... We got a lot. It's going to be really, really fun. The other thing we're doing is we're giving, we're going to have a phrase that we're going to give away throughout the episode, three-word phrase, that when you listen to the whole show, you can put together the whole phrase, three words, and then put it in chat towards the end of the show during the donation segment that, like, I'm doing now. And, uh, and whoever gets the full phrase at the end of the show will win a box of merch from our very good friend, Casey Armadillo, who makes fantastic merch stuff. He gave me a box of merch a while ago, and I thought, what better thing to do with it than to pass it along to some 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 listeners, some people that love the show. What better way to do it? So uh, that's what we're going to do. So our New Year's Eve show going to be big. Coming up this Sunday, Christmas Eve, we're doing a flashback episode because I got family, so I'm going to be doing stuff Christmas Eve, so we won't have a live show. But I am going to redo i'm gonna re-air episode one with blind mike my friend lucas dixon and uh and of course myself episode one we started it all it's gonna be fun so tune in for that and of course like i said don't miss out on the um sunday show uh new year's eve show but i want to wish wish you all a very merry christmas casey armadillo carlton turner matthew morfitt rihanna little clyde bedreau Aaron Rice, Alex Keeter, Edwin Everhart, Jesse, Jet Life Teague, Max Eclipse, Michael Benavides, Torsten Grotique, Morgan, Tist, Kanan, and Nathan Boldly Gone Higby. I love you all. From the bottom of my heart, I truly love you all. You mean the world to me. Very Merry Christmas to every single one of you. And, uh, and I hope you truly have a good one. Once again, help support the show. However you do. Time, talent, and treasure, that's what we're looking for. That's what we want. Join the community. Uh, we love you all. And uh, remember, ufonopodcast.net for all things UFO No, how to donate, how to get involved. Watch the live streams there, uh, as well as Rumble every Sunday, 6.30 p.m. Uh, once again, this coming Sunday, we won't have a live episode because it's Christmas Eve, but I'm going to show that episode one. But the next one will be live, and it's going to be big. So tune in. It'll be really, really fun. But without further ado, I love y'all. And I hope you have a great one. Peace out, y'all. Like I always say, keep your eyes to the sky. Stay elevated, of course. Stay elevated. Stay high, everybody. Stay high.
this Christmas. <laughs> Be up there in the clouds with Santa. Stay elevated. Keep your eyes to the skies and watch out for the government. They're shoisty bastards. Peace out, y'all. Love ya. Oh,